Rob Neal, thank you. Nice to have you here. Obviously, beautiful day in Florida. Weather's fantastic. Um, a lot of people know you for all the work you've done on sequencing with the full swing, but you're really very savvy in the short game too, and you've done some fascinating research on pitching. Pray tell. So I was really interested in, in the pitching side of the game, and I did a, a research study last year where I measured a lot of, of really high caliber tour players because I just wanted to find out what they were doing. I measured their uh, club delivery and, and ball flight information using a radar device and then um, the 3D system to measure what their body and the club were doing also. And there were some fascinating things that came out of it. So I was really interested in shots between 40 and 70 yards and how do players control the distance that they're going to hit this shot? These are carry distances. And there was the notion that Dave Pell's brought up that you know you have a 7.30, a 9 o'clock, a 10.30 swing, a length of swing, and then you hit different clubs to get different distances. And it kind of turns out when I looked at the 3D data that there was some merit in that whole notion. So what, what I found, for example, was that the height that the hands lifted during the backswing went up by about 10 centimeters or four inches for every 10 yards. Really? Yeah. That's, that's, so. That. so four inches. So, I mean, here, if I go up another four inches, that's probably going to go about another 10 yards and yep. that's going to go about another 10 yards. Yeah, so it, that was kind of, kind of interesting. And they turned their bodies, so pelvis and upper torso, turn them together? They don't turn them together, but, but to get increased distance, they turned each of them about three or four degrees more for every 10 yards. Right. So let's say, say you turned 30 and 70 for a 40 yard shot, yeah. then it was going to be 33 and 73 for the 50 yard shot, right. and 36 and 76 for the uh, 60 yard shot. Yeah, so it isn't simply just the arms then, there's a there's a turn factor increasing yeah. too. And that was another one of the interesting things is that the re relationship between pelvis and upper torso, despite the distance that you're hitting the ball, stayed constant. So that X factor, the difference between pelvis and upper torso turns, was constant across the whole distances. Now, perhaps one of the most controversial and interesting findings that I had, and it fitted perfectly with some uh, data then that uh, Frederick Tuxen um, uh, analyzed, was that the club shaft lean at impact was about 15 degrees forward. 15, one five. 15 degrees forward from, from 90, yeah, so 15 degrees. Martin, it was so, uh, out there when I first did the results, I re-ran them to make sure that I hadn't made a mistake in the calculations, but 15 degrees was the average. Well, one thing that's got my attention right away is I've got a, a club with 12 degrees of bounce on it. The bounce is very important, I hear, 12 degrees of bounce. So if I've got 12 degrees of bounce and I move my shaft forwards 15 degrees, surely that's negative three. How can I use the bounce? Or do I even use the bounce? You may gain a little bit of additional bounce by opening up the face, but then that then influences where the, the, the starting direction of the ball. So I don't think you open up the face a lot, a little bit maybe. I think what you have to do though, is you need to shallow the trajectory of the club head as it approaches the ball. And I think that's the key to being able to hit these small, shots here. So the club's coming in fairly shallow. Now, you're a scientist, you use all sorts of measuring machines. Does that mean it's coming in at one degree, 10 degrees? What's a decent angle of attack that would be shallow for a wedge? So, so for a 50 yard wedge shot, for example, five degrees down, which is very similar to your seven iron or, or eight iron. So it's not much, it's not down a lot, right? If you go shorter, I think the angle of attack is even shallower, so it gets closer and closer to zero. It's never zero, but it's very close to, you know, so down two or three degrees might be something that would be anticipated.
So the, so the shallowness, if I just clip one here, the shallowness then, or the lack of divot, should I say, the lack of divot, and there was no divot with that one, the lack of divot is actually more because of the blow coming in almost from behind the ball, very shallow. Um, and, and I think you told me before we started filming, something to do with the left upper arm and the chest. I've got that lean there and I'm going through and that's picked quite nicely, not quite 50 yards. I need to hit one a bit longer for you, actually. Um, and not too much risk going back. Yes? No. no? I, th I think that keeping very little hinge helps you to control the angle of attack. Ooh, so ooh. a guy like ooh. Steve Tri S Steve Stricker yeah. or Jason Day, when you watch them pitch, they have virtually no lag or additional ooh. angle. Bad. Yeah. <laughs> right, got it. So don't want to really increase the, the bend in that right wrist. All right. Now, where am I setting up with the hands a little no, bit? No, no, set, setting up neutral. Weight favoring the left, just a, Absolutely. Just a shade. Yep. Okay, going back with not much wrist action. Not going to try and put any in the change of directions. Something up here we're going to come to in a moment, but not too much not too much wrist, and that probably was about 50, and I wish for the rest of my life they clipped like that. Yeah. I mean, that's really clipped nicely. I, I think that the, the key point that we discussed, if you take your setup there, Martin, and now if you simulated where you would be at impact, your hands are going to be forward, yeah. but what you need is this orientation of your body, because as the, as the upper torso is turning, tilting and extending that flattens out the low part of your golf swing and that's the key I think to getting the shallow angle of attack and those beautiful um, bruising type divots. So if the upper torso is turning, tilting and extending, that's three motions, it's turning, side bend, tilting and extending. It certainly isn't spine angle, certainly isn't staying constant, <laughs> no, is it? Ridiculous idea. Constant. Now, you wanted me to get a club cover, and I presume you wanted to put under my left arm. Under your left arm, because I think that connection here, if you could, you could turn your upper torso and tilt it and, and extend it, but if you don't have a good connection here, then it doesn't help what happened right. to the club. So having something under there is very, very good for pitching because it encourages you to keep the connection and that shallows the club delivery for you. I must say, I mean, I'm getting the feel here, Rob, as I do this, that this is a, although it's a feel shot in the fingers, I'm also recruiting because of the lack of wrist action. I'm recruiting the bigger muscles of the body, which probably would work better under pressure, I think, wouldn't it? So? I think so, yeah. Okay, I'm going to hit one more here. Love it. So let's just review that. Weight favoring the left side slightly, hands only a little bit ahead of to dress, trying to stricker it in the backswing where there's not going to be much wrist action, but judging distance by amount of swing and turn. Yep. And a big thing to keep that pressure point between the left upper arm and the chest as I go through. I might start playing again if I keep doing that. <laughs> that's, that's really good. And one of the interesting things and important things is that you don't get this happening in pitching. You don't want the upper body moving back. It's got to keep forward and extending. Fascinating. I mean, really interesting stuff there. So, you know, real recap. Take the wrists out, let the body turn through, uh, have the hands ahead at impact. That's the way to get those nice, shallow divots, just like the tall pros do. <laughs>